You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything screenwriting. Here we interview successful screenwriters and filmmakers to find out just what it takes to make it in the industry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter, where we talk to every level in kind of notable screenwriter, sometimes producer, director, actor, hyphenates, who have done it all in the world of filmmaking, climbing all the higher rungs and making all of their mistakes so you don't have to be left in the dark. I am Jess Paul, one of those screenwriter, actor, director, producer, hyphenates, and I am talking to perhaps what you'd call the conductor of this creative orchestra of talents, the CEO of We Fix Your Script, the industry-ranked best-selling author of the guide for every screenwriter and the most relevant to this podcast, the creator and host of the successful screenwriter, Jeffrey Calhoun. How are you doing today, Jeff? <laughs> That's a it's an awesome intro, by the way. Thank you. I'm doing pretty great. I'm feeling amazing. So this episode's a little different because we've had a lot of listeners that have wanted to learn a little bit more about me and had some screenwriting questions in general. So I thought it'd be a great idea to bring someone on and um, answer all those questions for the listeners. And of course, you're top of my list. So thanks for coming on today and uh, flipping the script. Absolutely. I am so happy to do it. You know, Jeff, you and I know each other so well. We've honestly kind of interviewed each other in some sense back and forth. So I think I have a couple questions that will enlighten your audience a bit to who you are as a person, how you came about to do all the things that you do. You're very unique in the screenwriting world in the sense that you are not only a screenwriter, but you are there to help, to facilitate, to make this part of the industry more accessible, more friendly, and more helpful for those trying to break in. So I wanted to start with what might possibly be one of the more character revealing questions you've ever been asked, a way to really peel back the onion. And that question is, what is the best thing that you ate this week? The best thing that I ate this week. Um, well, I've cut out all the sugar, so yeah, I've been losing a lot of good things to eat. <laughs> um, but I did, uh, I did sneak a a caramel chai latte from Starbucks the other day, and that was pretty delicious. That's fantastic. You know, we we reward ourselves for being so good all the rest of the time, right? That's right. That's what that's for. Uh, that's that's good to know. Um, I myself, I've got. I've got, what is in this? It's a basic decaf coffee um, with cream, with heavy whipping cream. Yeah, and it's, it's getting, me, getting me through all my days. So let's start with kind of the origin story of Jeff. All right. Can you pinpoint a moment in your history when you first got the spark of, for writing in general? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I never aimed to be a writer. I didn't want to be a writer. Uh, being dyslexic, it was always difficult for me to, you know, in school learning how to just even alphabetize. So it was never on my radar. Um, but I knew a guy who was an editor on a daytime show for kids. It was a kid's show and uh, he wanted to get into screenwriting. So he had just randomly put out a challenge to anybody around him of who wants to, who wants to develop a screenplay and see uh and compete to see who could do a better one and and for some reason i said yes so uh i'm a little competitive so i developed a screenplay um ended up writing it and just fell in love with it but i didn't pursue it more until my wife found it in the kitchen and this is back when you would like print them up you know and she read it she really liked it and then i was like you know i really did enjoy this so since then i i never stopped and just really dove into this thing down this rabbit hole And, you know, that says a lot about your character, too, as you started the story talking about um, your dyslexia, that even with that kind of what we usually be perceived as something that might hold you back, you actually took the challenge, you grabbed it by um, by its shoulders and you and you ran with it. And it honestly lends a lot to your legacy so far um, when it comes to going above and beyond and also kind of helping people with similar maybe setbacks that they think won't 
allow them to do exactly what they want to do. How about a script that you read recently of somebody else's that really impressed you? Like even in even in your maturity as a, you know a, a screenwriting expert. I, I read a script the other day from a, a client that came to us and, and usually will recommend you know, notes or, or things like that. And, and this writer got it. They understood how to write something that is emotionally driven. It's not too long-winded. The theme is there. All of the elements are there. They know how to bake the cake. Mm-hmm. Um, so I even told them, I was like, you know, honestly, I don't really feel there is too much we can do for you on this if you want to do any kind of a mentorship, we can offer it. But I feel like you're at the level where you just need to believe in yourself. Wow. Wow. It's nice to to find those kinds of people out there. That's really cool. Sometimes you can, you know, really crave notes and that's great. But sometimes you can just get the bad notes and, and you can get bad notes from somebody that isn't sure. qualified to really be giving notes. And so maybe they read the script and they don't get it or it's above their level. Um, so they don't even understand what they're reading. And I think that was kind of the situation we were running into. Very interesting. That's coming from the other side of it, of of having something of such quality that that you might ruin it by getting bad notes or something like that. You know, I think I think that's a real thing, especially with like um, with like film festivals. I tell people that it's a bell curve. I think that with the film festival, you can really peak at a film festival where you're writing at a particular level and you're bringing home all the awards. But and this is from a guy that runs a film festival. I think you can be so good that you're beyond what the judges understand. And then you stop winning awards because I know several writers um, who were just crushing it on the festival circuit. And then their scripts after there weren't doing very well and they weren't placing. And I mean, I read those scripts like these are killer scripts. These are really good scripts. Mm. So I think they're just beyond what the readers or the judges are seeing, which is why in my festival at Script Summit, we strive really hard to make sure we have, you know, talented judges that can find that great work. Fantastic. Actually, that's a, that's a subject, you know, you have so many things going on that even the idea of Script Summit almost went to the back of my mind. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to, to date this interview. You can cut it out if you want to. But what is Script Summit doing to facilitate for the time that we're in, the year of 2020, 2021, where a lot of festivals are not even considering having a, like a, a located a festival? I'm excited the fact that we're going to make this podcast a historical document. So I don't have a problem problem with it. It's all staying in. Um, We went virtual last year. And this year, we are looking at trying to go live in person. But -hmm. the way the vaccinations are rolling out so slowly... I'm on the fence about it. I won't put anybody in danger. We could we could say it that of way. But we, we did it virtual last year. It was very successful. We had all of our guest speakers all pre-recorded specific topics that they spoke on for screenwriting. Then we put all of those on the website with access code for all of our community. And then we scheduled Q&A sessions afterwards so that people could then follow up with questions. And so it was actually, we were able to really accommodate COVID. I, I really wanted it to be a great experience and, and we got good feedback. Good. That's great to hear. You know, some festivals survived, some adapted, some failed or succeeded in the different way. Um, but to go back to you as a writer yourself, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you to possibly walk us through your own personal writing process in brief, but in totality, because every single screenwriter goes about an average writing day differently. I do want to know about your your steps, like especially the organization process of ideas, because it seems like that's the place where writers have their own way of approaching the original concepts. It does start with concept. I'll tell you my, I have like what I call the script pyramid. So in development, I go concept theme, central character, supporting character. So okay. I start on concept. When I get brought onto a project... The first thought I have is, what can I bring to this project of value? Because I don't want to come onto a project just for a gig, just for money. I want to come onto a project to elevate that project. So I want to make sure that I am bringing the, a voice that matters, right? So when I get the project, I look at it and I say, okay, what can I do with this thing? How can I make this thing shine? 
So after I start thinking about that, coming up with interesting and unique takes on it, like what has not been done yet or what has been done that I can do in a unique way that will make an, an audience interested in watching this or will grab a producer to fund this. So I start looking at marketability. I start looking at how to t- take and make it different. Then after I have the concept and I know I can bring something to the project, I look at the theme and I try and discover what about the central character that I'm designing and the theme can speak to some kind of universal human truth. So how do I take this character and I make them feel real, right? Mm -hmm. So once I do that and I have my theme, I then infuse the theme of the story into the character's art so that the character becomes essentially a living embodiment of the story's theme as they're traveling through their journey. And then I bring in supporting characters that can reflect the theme as the antithesis or the thesis of the theme, but also supporting characters that can, as you mentioned earlier, unpeel the layers of onion around that character because you can explore a central character and get depth from a central character by how they interact with the supporting characters. So I I mix that all together and I bake my cake. Now the active writing process for me is getting up late in the day. I'm not an early bird. I'm not the five o'clock in the morning guy. I roll out of bed nine, 10 o'clock. I get my breakfast and my chai latte. Then I get in here in my office and I start writing. And the writing itself, I lose time. So I'll be in here at 10 o'clock, eight to 12 hours could pass before I, I know it. So I'll lose days. I'll, uh, days will bleed together. Sometimes I'll forget to eat. That's not really healthy. Don't do that. But essentially, I, I kind of zone in and do it and I can bang, you know, bang out up to 20 pages a day. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Hopefully that gives a little bit of insight on, you know, one of the ways you can organize a script and start to conceptualize and and build the world, build the characters. If we want to break down kind of the process even more, let's talk a little bit about formatting, if you would like. Um, One thing that I wanted to ask you about when it comes to formatting, I'm a formatting junkie. I believe that the rules are there for a reason. If everybody can read the blueprint, they can build the house stronger. So. Are there any formatting conventions that you would throw out the window? So what people are doing right now, formatting that I could just get rid of. Okay. And not worry about, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. The cut twos. I mean, they kill me. Is it because like you're already obviously cutting to another scene anyways? It's redundant. Redundant. When you go to a new scene, you're cutting two, right? (laughs) Right. You don't need to say you're cutting two. And so getting rid of that, but I went through a script and I removed all the cut twos from it for a client. And I mean, I cut out like two pages. So if that, if that tells you like how excessively spacing it is, you're bloating out your script. So on the opposite hand, you know, since you've worked with scripts for so long and maybe even derived your own shorthand, Is there anything that you would love to add to the format? Like, for example, I listen, I used to listen to the Script Notes podcast. And one thing I think that um, John August wanted to apply or or was throwing around was the idea of like uh, color coding parts of the script, which I, I know sounds really out there. But is there anything like that that you wish could be integrated into screenplays that might be a little bit more useful for us as modern screenwriters? It's a really interesting thing you said that I actually just interviewed the other day, I interviewed Linda Seeger and um, making a good script. Great. So, I mean, she's, she's a legend. She started the script consulting oh, wow. industry, right? Mm-hmm. She, and I got to interview her, which is so I was like super geeking out. And I'm like, Linda. So what she did is she would color code subplots. And I thought that was brilliant. So she would color code subplots for her clients and say like, okay, here, this subplot is green. You don't have green for 30 pages. That's a big issue. I was like, I think that is absolutely a brilliant idea. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't even know about that connection. So I I had a fun question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. You have three client scripts on your desk. Okay. A mysterious psychological thriller, a fresh indie rom-com and a historically based period piece. Which are you personally more excited to read first? I'm going to read the thriller. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to read the thriller because 
to mm. write a thriller, it, it, a good thriller is exceptionally difficult because you have to build backwards. You have to start when you're like conceptualizing it, developing, you start with the end, you start with whatever the big mystery is, and then you build the chain of events backwards of, of the big reveal. So hard to do. I've done it. So I respect anybody that can accurately write a thriller. Writing my follow-up questions live here in interview. <laughs> All right. Talking about your own speculative writing to talk about, you know, genres that you prefer. Do you believe that there is a genre that you keep returning to despite kind of, because I know that you do, you're flexible and most screenwriters for the most part should try to at least be flexible. But what, what do you love writing more than anything else? I I don't have a, a, a preferred genre. I mean, I'm known as the thriller guy, but okay. um, I'm not, I don't have a preferred genre. My thing is I inject comedy into anything. That, Me that, too, buddy. Yeah. That's why we yeah. we talk so well together. <laughs> it's We're on true. the same wavelengths about yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's really is true. It could be like a sad drama. It could be like Lorenzo's oil, and I'm like, let me fit in a funny scene. You know, and it's just like I I, I just have to do it because comedy is a is a palate cleanser emotionally on screen. So it allows you to start to weave in more heavier tones as well. So it's such a delicate thing though. You can't go too ham with it. You can't go mm -hmm. too light with it. Um, so I say that's, that would be my thing is if you're bringing me onto a gig, you're going to get a couple of funny moments. This podcast is brought to you by the successful screenwriter.com where you can find instructional books, videos, courses, and screenplays of Hollywood's biggest hits to download as an added bonus. Visit www.thesuccessfulscreenwriter.com to download the guide for every screenwriter for free. Yes, free. Available exclusively at thesuccessfulscreenwriter.com. Now, back to our show. That's what I think, like, when you are developing a story that's important to the world, like a message within your your plot, your characters that you want to convey, uh, you get people to the theaters with the jokes in the trailer, and then you, you like, you know, sneak the medicine into their, their pie, you know, as they watch the movie. That's at least how I look at it. Uh, oh, so like they it. can enjoy it, but also get something valuable from what they're watching. That's awesome. I never even considered the trailer aspect of it. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I literally, my first film I ever wrote, the first concept I ever had it, of it was what the trailer looked like and how it went and how oh, it was cut. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. That's, That's the really marketer cool. of me talking, the performer. <laughs> You know, Let me think about this trailer real quick, and then I'm going to write this screenplay. I think that's it really awesome. Did. It's a it's a good uh, it's a good exercise, I think, to try that. Yeah, kind of a reverse, you know, deconstruction, trying to see what kind of movie you ultimately want to write to, yeah. to see, you know, how it's going to end up, to, so that you can know where to start. It is 2021. Do you have a New Year's resolution? Do you believe in something like that? I, I don't believe in them. I, I don't believe in in New Year's resolutions. I never have because I've had some close calls in my life where I might not have made it. Uh, so having survived those moments, I strive to live every day as if it's like, this is it. So like when I hug family members, I hug them a little bit longer. When I eat something delicious, like if mm -hmm. I sip that chai latte, I sip on it a little bit longer, you know? So I try, I try and strive hard to live every moment, not waste moments, even on like, um, Netflix days, even then I still try and really enjoy those moments. So, so I don't, I believe that you commit to something, you commit to it and, and I, and I stay committed to it. I like that. I myself uh, give myself more lighthearted ones, like not like, you know, make your career happen this year for realsies. Like I, I try to just set some minor goals and mine this year was to watch more movies, specifically some of the classics, oh, yeah. because I've seen zero of them, literally. Like, I just watched Goodfellas for the first time last week in my life. If you, so if you could give me three movies, putting you on the spot here. Oh, man. You know, okay, that I can okay. watch for their exemplary writing, you know? Oh, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah. What, what would three of those movies be throughout the history of movies? Happy to do it. So as an actor, I would say The Fountain. You would love okay. The Fountain. That's so interesting. I asked my friend literally this last night, and she yeah. said The Fountain. One of the I'm best. Not kidding. It is, yeah. One of the best monologues you'll find is in The Fountain. It's like a three-minute monologue. Okay. It's fantastic. Another one. I think Pi. 
See, I'm going, I'm getting Aronofsky on here. I have to think of one you haven't seen. This is, this is the issue. Oh, but. just assume I've seen none of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. There's a movie <laughs> I just watched a few weeks ago. I actually had the director on my podcast called Dave Made a Maze. Did you watch that one? Uh-uh. Dave Made a Maze is great. Okay. It's, it's like, I watched this movie and I was like, I got to get this guy on my show. <laughs> like, so, so I ended up getting the director on the show. So I think Dave Made a Maze is really good. Did I give you three? Yeah. That okay. was, and I've got right. them. They're documented in this podcast. All right, fantastic. But maybe, maybe it would be a goal of mine to watch those three movies by the time you get this up, whenever that might be. We'll yeah, see. that sounds good. <laughs> um, did you ever get a lot of chances or have any kind of stories? I'd like to move into this topic. This is fascinating for me too, to watch as a screenwriter some of your writing being produced. Maybe. Um, an example of like a really wonderful translation, or maybe an example, you don't have to give specifics about when, you know, your script was taken and really gone through the ringer of, of, of the, the production process. Yeah. I got brought onto a gig to fix a, a feature that was shooting in like three days mm-hmm. and I had to fix everything. So I had to go <laughs> through and, and, and change everything. So it was two 15 hour days of writing straight to fix the whole script i mean i did i had to redo everything the the script went through seven different writers um before me and it was insane i actually ended up getting tinnitus (laughs) after because i was up for so long so i couldn't hear out of my right ear for like a week um so i so i fixed the script sent it to them they loved it and then used like a third of everything i did (laughs) i was just like that's like yeah. super frustrating. Other moments I've had where I um I I wrote specific dialogue. See, the thing is like when you when you write something, you can you can attest to this. When you write something, you hear how it's going to be read by the by yes. the actor. And then but that's not fair to the actor because the actor is going to bring their whatever particular choices they make to read that line. So you, you, you're watching it and then you're like, okay, here comes this line. I love. And then they say the line and like, God, that's not how I heard it. It's <laughs> so, so it's, it's like, you don't want to criticize anybody because they need to make mm-hmm. their creative choices. But at the same time, a, a little bit of yourself is probably disappointed because you have built up this incredible moment in your mind, like, Oh, this is going to be so, so exciting. And then it's like, Oh, I was always so interested in that because, you know, as I was growing up through the industry, the indie industry, climbing those really low rungs, I, I was always, I always considered myself an actor first. And to be honest, in the very beginning, I was working with a lot of writer directors because the best resource a writer had to find a director was themselves. Like that only made sense for them to do as many hats as possible. So I was always very curious, you know, the the average experience uh, that a screenwriter would take would have watching their own material being performed because there's so much mediation between the actual document or even your intention that was in the document and the way that things were written to like through the production process, through the rewrites, through the director, then finally through the, through the actor and then finally through the editing process when it comes out. So do you have any advice for maybe some screenwriters that are getting some of their material produced for the first time, how to kind of settle with that idea that yeah. their their stuff will be going through a long process of deviation. It's it's like a distillation process, really. Yeah, like you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, you like you write it, and then it's going to be filtered several times through several different people. A couple of things come to mind. Um, I like this quote. They say screenwriting is not an art; is an invitation to create art. Mm, okay. And I think that's interesting. I agree with it mostly but i do think screenwriting is an art on its own but it is an invitation to say hey let's make this project together and so thinking that way thinking of it as an invitation that means that this thing is not set in stone we are inviting other people to include their voices in this screenplay so you need to know going into any kind of a gig or even a spec that you sell is this thing is going to change you are not selling or optioning the final draft of this script. Mm -hmm. It's actually best to think about the fact that if you option a script or you get brought on for us for a project and you provide a script, think of it as the first draft. Really, that's the the best way to think of Mm -hmm. it. Um, 
because the director is going to want to have his voice in it. He's going to want to change things. A producer might, an actor might, you know, and then by the time it hits editing, it's going to be completely different anyway. So understand going into the process that it is going to change. You, you don't want to be so linear in your thinking that you're fighting everybody, fighting every change, because then you become known as the difficult screenwriter. Right. Like I was saying before, you, you know, you're, you're making the blueprint, not the final house, you know, that, that you're going to be selling. So yeah, that's, that's very good advice. But let's talk about your transition into kind of the business of helping screenwriters from, you know, from being a screenwriter yourself. Right. So what made you at first want to become involved with the screenwriter consulting uh, side of this entire industry? I am a working writer. And so being able to do that and then come into We Fix Your Script allows me to bring a different level of mentorship to writers that I think they maybe can't get at several other places. And and how this started was I was at a film festival in London and I was watching a, an indie film and I was just like, this wasn't very good. So I was mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm, I, I, respectfully I bowed out and I went in the lobby and I found it I found respectfully a I'm never respectful I really try but I usually <laughs> just kind of am very obvious I'm always in the front row I'm always wearing the brightest outfit are you huffing and puffing are you are you saying are you saying funny one-liners under your breath as you're walking out <laughs> I try I try to keep as respectful as you're possible. throwing you're throwing mad shade so <laughs> so I uh I I so I scooch out as much as I can, I get to the lobby. I see this director really struggling on the screenplay. So, you know, I go and I sit down with him. I say, Hey, how's it going? I introduce myself and he's stuck on the script. So I look at the script and we spent like half hour together and I, and I fixed his script and he was like, <laughs> you know, blew his mind. Um, well, after that, I, I got a reputation at the festival as like, go see this guy. He's fixing scripts. So I'm, I'm wow. like, I'm like holding court. You know, people are, there was like literally a couple of guys like running over. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sitting in this sofa. So, so, uh, so yeah, I was, I was fixing scripts. And then I started thinking about, well, maybe this is something I could do to help other people. Uh, so, so I started, I started, we fix your script.com, but we, we took more of a, uh, of a, of a mentorship approach. So we'll take your script on, we'll evaluate it. We'll, we'll, we'll suggest, you know, potential fixes. And then, but we take an approach of not just improving the script, but improving the writer as well. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's really, so we kind of invest ourselves in our, in our clients. And I think that kind of elevates what we do. When I think of a screenwriter, there usually is kind of a basic personality that you might stereotype a screenwriter with, which might be like, you know, the introvert in the room full of, you know, big personalities and and such like that. Do you think that you had to have a unique personality to take on the role of being either a mentor or, or, or even a business person with your own companies kind of heading the way within, was still within the idea of, of screenwriting, the topic of screenwriting? It's, Jess, it's such a, a a good question because this has been such an incredible path of growth for me as a person. I mean, anybody who knew me first coming out knew that I was the loner guy on the couch that wouldn't talk to anybody, totally freaking out. That's cr- Let me just say something. That's crazy to me because of the way that we met. Do you remember us meeting? Yes. Yes, yeah. I do remember that. We were. It was I at walked a right up to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. You handed me some merch. Uh, you know, I was working on, on you know, uh, I, I think pre-pro for one of my movies uh, with my with my director. And we were sitting at a table in, uh, you know, a, a dive, a, a dive, a dive bar. Yeah, it was like a it was like a hotel <laughs> restaurant dive bar slash. Yeah. yeah all of those things. And, and you made the first move. So tell me about oh, how you became that person then. Yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. I just, I Oh my goodness, man. Just lots of, uh, lots of attempts, lots of failed attempts, lots of, you know, dealing with the fact that I have anxiety, like mm-hmm. I have anxiety. So like dealing with that and, 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 and figuring out how to work through that and get past the fear. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I hated, I would, I would stutter with people. Um, and, uh, and so walking up to you was, was big for me. Cause that was like me starting to really, uh, find my voice as a person, which has been like a whole big part of so this. Not path. only a screenwriter, not only a business owner, but a human being. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely human. Uh, one thing I liked about you, and I'll never forget this, is how you locked in on me when I when we were talking. Because I do that with people when I talk with someone, I lock in on them. Like, uh, and and most people, when you talk to them, they're distracted by everything. They're distracted by the world. But you were there, um, and I respected that because that's how I am. And um, and so I always kind of kept you in the back of my mind because of that. Forcing myself to do interviews, um, doing interviews I didn't want to do. And there was people that helped me along the way um, that that would throw me in front of a camera when I'd be sweating, you know, or I remember one interview I did, you'll love this, was story live time. on, oh, story time, L- live, get your popcorn kids. It was live on Facebook, a Facebook interview. And they're asking me, inter- they're asking me screenwriting questions and I'm discussing it, trying to do the best I can. Awful. And, uh, and I just remember, cause it was, I could see the screen as a FaceTime. And I just remember saying thumbs down, thumbs down. <laughs> thumbs what? down really? people, people comment and get this guy off i fell asleep it was it was that's awful that you're seeing was, that in real time it was so bad. i only so, see it after the fact once i put up a video and you know because it was live i was like well this is this is great this makes me want to keep going so obviously after going through that it's like okay i need to be more more me more dynamic and then and then just meeting people along the way that that mentored me on how to um, become more of a better interviewer of, and finding more of myself as a personality. So do you, so would you say then after saying all that, that like anybody can develop more of a sense of, of comfort and composure when, when wanting to do that kind of thing, reaching out to people like that? Oh my God. Absolutely. Like, like, I don't know if you, if you know that I wrote a blog about the first time I had an anxiety, anxiety, panic attack at a film festival. I must have missed I that one, but I would really love to read it because I think it'd be very helpful. I'll, t- I'll tell you. So I'll tell you what happened. So I was going to do the very first time I was going to do a red carpet event. So I was going to go on the red carpet. I was going to get interviewed by the local news and all that stuff. So it was, it was, a, it was a deal. And I was so nervous that I had, my plane had come in late. So I hadn't slept as dehydrated. And again, anxiety. So I'm there, I'm looking at the red carpet. I'm like, okay, I need to go up there and I need to do this interview. And so then as I, as I get ready to like do it, I bust a bloody nose, like, (laughs) like the, like the worst you've ever heard of. Right. It's all over. I run into the bathroom and I color were you wearing? Oh God, I was wearing a blue, but I think I was able to like prevent it. Okay. So, so, but I'm in the bathroom and I mean, just, it just looks like like a Tarantino film, right? It's just like splatter everywhere in this bathroom. And the guy runs into the bathroom, sees me, sees the (laughs) condition of the bathroom, doesn't even say a word, turns around, runs out. So I scare the hell out of this guy. And then, (laughs) and so then I remember looking in the mirror, thinking to myself, I don't have to do this. I could go home back to my family and this could, this could be over. And then I remember thinking to myself, if I don't do this, I'll never be able to look at myself the same way again. I have to do it. So I pulled myself together, cleaned myself up, went out, did a horrible interview on the red carpet and got past it. But that was one of the big moments I remember of like, this is a do or die moment. If I do this, you know, I can get better. If I don't do this, I'll go home and I'll live my simple life. So it's, it's confronting those moments that can stop you because because fear is a good thing because fear is an opportunity for greatness right once you learn that you can overcome something then it it almost diminishes the fear altogether and doesn't make it as much of a threat you know transitioning from the creative side to again we're talking about the business side maybe uh owning your own company um, it doesn't have to be script consulting, you know, screenwriters can kind of be their own representative when it comes to things, even selling yeah. their own script. Brand you themselves. Know, um, do you think that uh, there's anything that you would change about the process of selling selling a brand or selling a script? Or do you think it's best to kind of adapt to how things are? You have to be adaptable if you're going to to make it in this industry. I'll give you an example. So there's AI software right now that's being developed, actively being developed that can write screenplays. I we've seen it. It 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 uh 
coughs up some pretty unique. Right. It sounds like word salad or like it's having a stroke, but the, the technology is getting better and better and better. So in five to 10 years, you'll have, you'll have AI that can assist you in writing a screenplay. Hmm. So it comes down to, okay, how do you use that technology to still further your own career? And there are ways to do it. So it's, it's just making sure that you don't become so pigeonholed in your career that you can't build out of it, which is why I tell writers, don't be a, a single genre writer. Mm. What if, you know, horror films aren't popular for 10 years straight and you're a horror writer? Well, you're out of work. So you want to, you want to make sure that you can kind of diversify what you do and be adaptable. I mean, you have to be able to adapt to, to the storytelling itself, but then adapt to the notes you get from your clients, adapt to the notes you get from your directors and producers. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely essential. What do you kind of predict for the next, like, let's say three years of the industry, and if it's going to be more helpful for screenwriters, maybe giving indie screenwriters a new avenue or do you think it's there's some more walls put up i know it's again another loaded jess paul question but (laughs) let's start the conversation huh Uh, all right yeah so it is exceptionally difficult to kind of quote break in right Mm -hmm. and it's always going to be hard it was hard back in the day it's even harder now because there is not as much demand as there is scripts that are out there, right? So there's hundreds of thousands Mm -hmm. of script out there, but there's only so much demand. So, so it's hard to break in. It's always going to be hard to break in. Is it going to be easier? No. I think the formula is the same. How do I become a, a working writer? How do I get paid for my writing? And I think the myth of I'm going to write this spec script I'm going to sell it for thousands, hundreds of thousands and make my big break. It is a myth. And I think once you can really change your perspective on what you view as success, I think that is what leads you to to a career. I went into this with my screenplay that did really, really well, won several festivals, had been optioned several times, never got made, probably will never get made. I wasn't at the point like, I have to sell this. I was just like, this is what I can do. Can I do anything for you? And that is what has had started getting me work because they would read my script. They would see what I'm capable of doing. They would hear my voice as a writer and they would say, you know what? I would like your voice as a writer to work on this project that I have. And that can get you work. When you show a client your your portfolio, uh, do you what are you handing to them particularly? Are you handing them full feature screenplays? Are you handing them treatments? Like what is the actual document that that you're zipping up and putting in an email? Because those are the technicalities that not of all of us are on a clear page about sometimes. And I'll have a, a client say, "Well, I, I'm I'm looking for um, say horror comedy, right?" So I say, "Well, I have this great horror comedy," and I'll, I'll ask them, "What would you like? Would you like to send a synopsis?" Or like the script okay. treatment and they'll say oh well i would just like the log line so i give them a log line and and i mean i've had it where they'll go well, i would just like the log line send them a log line and then they'll go well how about a short synopsis and i send them a short synopsis and they go okay. well how about the full synopsis i send them the one sheet how about the treatment i'll send them the treatment and then they go let me look at the script and so then i'll send them <laughs> the script so like I've, I've i've had that happen so it's essential that when you're developing a, and building out these specs that you're writing that you have all of those steps and that you have all of those steps done well, because there are writers that have written 20 scripts, no synopsis, no good to know. So writing the screenplay is one aspect of the entire process. So create that log line, short one sheet treatment, include all that stuff and make it good. That's the best advice. Don't be caught flat footed. You know, if mm-hmm. somebody requests your synopsis and you don't have one and then you have to bang one out real quick in a day, it's going to be a crappy synopsis. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, you definitely want to have all of those things created as well as as your screenplay. Don't just stop at the script. Yeah, I'm like digesting all that information. Well, there's a new thing you get with writers right now is you'll see, there's a lot of writers that are making um, posters for their screenplays. And what do you think about that? I'm okay with it. Joanne and Hess did one with it with a spec that we're writing, and we sent it to a producer because they were they were potentially interested in this um, spec that we're writing. And they go, they go, 
I love that poster. And now they're interested. So I think it's fine. It, if it's good, that's, you know, that's the thing, like quality wise, you have to make sure that you're creating something that, that really adds to the project. Don't make Absolutely. something just to make it. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've seen posters that hurt the project. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> there it is. Too. Yeah, you get it. Being a, a graphic designer is my day job. I've seen, uh, you know, and in fact, I have been making pitch decks. So maybe even what do you think about that for a, a, literally a screenplay that hasn't been even created? Yeah. Um, you're pitching. Yeah. You have all the imagery you want to include. You have the character breakdowns. You have some uh, beautiful pictures and colors to go along with it. What do you think? Yeah, you can do pitch deck lookbooks are even starting to creep into lookbooks, that's right. lookbooks are creeping into um, screenwriting. So people that are doing those are, are they're, they're hundred percent in on the spec and they really want to move it. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why they're doing pitch decks or, and they're doing lookbooks. And then that's fine. If that's something that, you know, you want to invest in. That topic brings me to another conversation, something that I've thought of for the, honestly, the most of my career as I began to build it, you know, when we are in this industry that's becoming a little bit more accessible to anyone who wants to enter because of the resources that are available to people, either free or cheap, uh, especially with the, uh, the, you know, the, the existence of the internet. What do you believe about the person that says that you might have to be a multi-hyphenate to get to get your project across? For a screenwriter who, again, it might be someone who, um, is not, you know, is just wanting to be a writer. Do you, how, how imperative do you think it is to kind of cons for a screenwriter to consider maybe becoming a director or, or, or maybe developing really close ties, you know, selling their, their self as such, or, or maybe even um, becoming really close with the director you always work with. Like what, what are some of the standards these days that will get a screenwriter to success and do they have to go into the realm of being their own producer or director? It's a Jess Paul question. It's such a Jess Paul question. <laughs> So, I want to hear what you think. I'm loving it though. This is fun for me. Uh, I think there are several, like in the guide for every screenwriter. So in my book, I talk about, there are several ways to, to define success for yourself. So first step is what do I consider success, right? And there is more than one way to quote, make it. Um, and that's what, cause I hate that. I hate that. Oh, they've made it. Well, what does that mean? Because right. there are, there are several ways to make it. So um Becoming a writer director and self-funding or crowdsourcing or getting fu getting funding from investors and creating your script and directing it, that is one avenue for success. Creating um, relationships in the business and going on it and being hired to write other people's stuff is another avenue. Um, doing things like 48-hour film festivals and networking that way and, and kind of working your way into a community to eventually be able to leverage that community, that is another way for success. But whatever you do, I always make sure that it's it's sincere and authentic never go into a relationship with the divisive means of I'm going to network with this person so that I can get what I want. That, that is, uh, people see right through that. You want to be able to be that person that provides value and to be that person that people want to work with. And if you're that sincere, love what you do, want to help other people, people will gravitate towards that because when you are working on a film, in a script, you have to look at it like you're working in an office. People want to work with people they want to work with, not with people that, right. that, are, that are trying to use them to get something. I feel like you just were reading the script that's in my brain a lot of the time. Like I believe, I want to second that uh, full heartedly. Only in recent years have I found myself going to a festival and um, enjoying myself, actually just making friends for the sake of you know, being inspired by other people, having great conversations, you know, and when that, that contact that you're meeting, um, wants to find the person that's going to help them to the next project, what you said was incredibly relevant and, and so true that they are going to go to the person they trust, not the person that tr that shoved their business card under their nose before even getting to know who they were talking to somebody that you, you believe you can be an actual collaborator with. Think about if, if any screenwriter is out there th thinking about, um, 
all the people that they know themselves, the kinds of people they would go to first. It most likely is a good friend. You know, it, it, sometimes it's a good friend above somebody who is, you know, outright, you know, known in the local industry, you know, your local industry, because you feel like you can trust them on a personal level. I say that about acting too. When you go into the audition room, one thing that you want to make people feel, you know, uh, you don't want to make them nervous about casting you because you're going to be spending a lot of time with that person. They are not only casting for your your abilities, but they're casting for the person that they want to work with yep. every day for over a month. So you want to be genuine first. And, and then when somebody comes knocking, you can pick from the projects of the people that, that are asking you that are. Wondering. Well, uh, it, it's funny you say that. So mm -hmm. I had an Emmy award winning director say to me, Jeff, I want to work with you. I really like you. And the fact that you're a good screenwriter is a bonus. <laughs> I think it's true. I, well, that, that speaks volumes, you know? Yeah, I, I believe it. Um, one thing one thing that I think is so unique about you too is that, you know, you do have this business and you are kind of a personality on top of, of being a creative. Um, this is kind of a cerebral question, but there were, okay. was there any uh, lessons that you learned developing a business, being in the business world, being kind of on the, maybe the marketing side of the industry that helped to inform yourself as a creative, as a writer? That's a, that's pretty broad. And um, it, you know, it, it, it lacks a lot of specific categories, but can you think of something that, you know, having your unique experience as a CEO, as a, someone who talks to people all the time uh, ha has informed you as a screenwriter the one thing i learned quick is, is branding is exceptionally important so like branding who you are and what you do so when people see it they automatically know what it is i mean that that's so important because you have so many different types of consulting firms out there and there's just a lot of competition and i knew that going into it what i saw was in the industry you would get feedback from professionals and and they would just tear it down they were rude sometimes they would attack you personally and it was all to make you better or they would be mean because you know even try and bully you out of the industry because they're doing you a favor because you shouldn't be in it in the first place and 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 all of these things i had experienced firsthand and there was companies even proud of it. You know, they were proud of how brutal they were. And I started thinking about like, like, this isn't helping anybody. Like, wow. like you're beating up on people. And then you're proud of the fact that they gave up on their passion. Maybe you should be fostering the passion. So I saw in the industry an opening for a niche of a company that would have a, a more positive mentorship capacity that could be brought to the field and try and change the narrative. And I have to tell you, I don't know if we're responsible for this or not, but I have seen other script consultants, script doctors and covered services out there are less rude like they are now striving harder to be more positive to give that critical feedback but in a way that helps people instead of being like that bitter screenwriter yeah it sounds like there were a bunch of mean girls in the industry <laughs> one thing that i never sort understood of. was when you know you had somebody who was popular in school they were the the people that were the meanest that, yeah. that would bully people. And I never yeah. understood how those two things correlated. Well, yeah. the part that bothered me is that they were proud of it. Like they yeah. like they hung their shingle up on it. I was like, why would you be proud of that? So I think it was just something that had become ingrained in the industry. So so we came in to like, hey, you know, we're we're not gonna blow smoke. We're not gonna be like, oh my God, your script is amazing right. when it's terrible. But we're gonna say like, hey, this is what it needs and we're happy to help teach you how to do it and and inspire you to be better. And, and I think that's hopefully starting to bleed into the industry a little bit. I know the people that we have worked with have really appreciated it. I mean, one of our clients won Nichols. So right. that was like such a huge honor to just even be just a sliver of part of that person's journey we've had all screenwriters will know what that means we'll know yeah. how important that is yeah. yeah and so and then we've had other writers we've worked with um who have gone on to win awards or get stuff produced so like it just feels good to be able to do that so with with we fix your script branding was essential with script summit what i've learned was how important it is to add value 
to the industry because there's like thousands of screenplay and screenwriting and film festivals out there. A lot of them can be scams that just want money. And so I realized, okay, we need to create a community. Of course, you're going to do that. But how do we create value for the community? So it wasn't just about like, let's give away beautiful awards, but a cash prize or a contract with a Hollywood talent manager, like really striving to, to bring in these things that can help the screenwriting community and help elevate people. Let, yeah, actually, that's a subject that I didn't even have in my questions before, but not only is Script Summit a festival that derived from We Fix Your Script, which had dedicated itself for years on helping screenwriters to become, you know, that much better at their craft as individuals, but Script Summit came with a year long in between the festivals Facebook group where yeah. people, this community where people from the festival, all of the screenwriters that are participating and even those who like don't even have a hand in the game yet. They're kind of just, you know, feeling it out or working on their, their, their amateur status to rise above sure. that. They are helping each other. Um, what is something that you've taken away from actually like harvesting a community of screenwriters together. This is going to sound like a cheesy reply. I'm honored to have provided that. It, it touches me. I, I get a little like verklempt when I see writers on there talking with each other. Um, and there's there's a sense of pride with it when we have the festival and people come together who haven't seen each other in years. Um, and I see them like, sneak off into a corner and chat and catch up like yeah. that that hits me that hits me deep um because but you facilitated their meeting and their friendship yeah, like I, actual relationships amongst the people at the festival exactly it's just like you know and i like to hold on to that feeling and and even locally in the detroit area we have a, like a mini summit meeting when when covid isn't trying to kill everybody mm -hmm. um and and people come together and i and i watch people just kind of do like a sidebar with their coffees and it's like it, it it feels good um and it's and it's nice to be able to um to create that I, I agree. That must be a wonderful feeling to, to even have even a, a smaller community of my own who like uh, reads the articles and, and watches the videos. Um, it's wonderful to see people. It's, it's, it, it goes beyond you, doesn't it? It's, yeah. it's about creating a, an actual legacy from something that you started, you create the name for you, you know, create like bought the, the space, you know, you rented the space where everybody could meet. And then they, they basically fulfilled that beyond you, which is, just a, I'm sure it's such a wonderful feeling. Well, you, you touch someone's life. That's why we're here. I think if you want to go like super metaphysical. Oh, right? I believe it's, like, it, this it's is not it. even metaphysical. Like, like, you know, it, I believe in a, in a connection amongst all of us that is not magical necessarily, but it's the way that we interact with people every single day, be it over the internet through the things that we create that maybe with people we haven't even met. This world is about interconnectivity in a, in a pretty practical sense. So yeah. when you get to add yourself in there as a positive addition to this world and this history, it's, it's a pretty, pretty good thing to go to sleep with, I think, sometimes. For the last question, to steal from some of the great interviewers like James Lipton and Stephen Colbert, Jeff, what do you think happens when we die? Oh, yeah, I definitely think that we, uh, we hit the other side. And um, I, I believe in heaven. I believe in, in, in higher levels of reality. So I'm down with it. Hopefully yeah. I make it. <laughs> hopefully you make it fantastic so you are all you guys are already on the successful screenwriter podcast if you are listening to this you can go out go and check out script summit you know just type it into good old google you can go and check out wefixyourscript.com you can pick up the guide for every screenwriter and if you are interested in the interviewer for today uh, i am just paul you can also google me um this is just paul is all my handles including my YouTube show. Awesome. Do you have anything to say, Jeff, as we as we wind down this interview? Well, I just wanted to say thanks again for coming on the show, Jess, because I know this is something that listeners had been asking for, and there isn't anybody else I'd want on the show asking me these questions, diving in deep on these topics other than you. And of course, for all the listeners out there, check out This Is Jess Paul on her YouTube. Thank you, Jeff, giving it right back. I appreciate it.
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share in your social media where you can tag us at The Successful Screenwriter.